Hi, I'm Chuck Bender and welcome to CNC Projects for the Traditional Woodworker. Thanks a lot for coming out to the seminar. I really appreciate you deciding to spend your time with me, whether this is your first seminar this season or you've been here for every one the entire month. Really, I truly appreciate it. And if you ever have any woodworking questions at all, please head over to my website, acanthus.com, check out all the hands-on and virtual classes, but more importantly, you can get my email address off there and you're welcome to send me a qu any question you may ever have about woodworking. I really appreciate you taking your time and spending it with me. So if you have been following along since I did the CNC basics from last week, I'm still relatively new to CNC woodworking. And I know a lot of people don't consider it woodworking, they just consider it cheating. I'm still not exactly sure how far I'm willing to go in creating my projects with a CNC machine. I can see tons of benefits from using one and having one in the shop, but I'm still not sure if I'm gonna set up and, and do trifid or uh, bong claw feet, carved shells, those kinds of things on there because to me that's part of the craft that I've spent my entire career learning how to do. I really found a lot of places over the last month or so of using the, the Hammer HNC here in the shop that I could really implement a tool like that on a fairly regular basis. I mean if you were here last week for the CNC basics, you saw that I made these triangles. I mean, I used to do them on the table saw and then drill holes in them at the drill press to use them to create miters on my miters on my crosscut sled. But you know, laying it out in SketchUp and then taking it to the CNC machine, they're a whole lot more accurate than I could ever get before doing these things just on the table saw, sort of rigging them up to get them cut up there. The other thing that I can see that is a great boon to a traditional woodworking shop is I do a fair amount of stuff in the vacuum bag to, to press veneers and do bent laminations. What I've got over here actually is a form and a, a basic backsplat. Uh, this is mahogany that I've taken and re sawn, and we've bent it around this form in order to create the backsplat for a Chippendale chair. And it's not the traditional method of doing it, but it means that I don't have to worry about coming up against short grain because I've cut across a much thicker piece. I can also get not so much on this piece, but if I was using more figured wood, curly maple say, or curly cherry or something like that for an entire set of chairs, I can get the back splats out of fewer boards and boards that all match. So not that I'm gonna turn around and make the back splat using the CNC machine, but I could certainly see setting up and making the form itself. Typically, we would cut one of these sections out. This is all just three quarter inch plywood that's screwed together. And what we would do is cut one out and shape it and then use a flush cut pattern bit at the router table and continue to make more. And if you run your hand across this, which you can't unless you come here for a class, you'll notice that these things are not all perfectly in line with one another. There's some hills and valleys in there where as we were gluing and screwing the, the various layers together, they didn't come up perfectly flush on the top. Nothing wrong with that. We've functioned with this for 25 years. It's not like it's going to make a huge difference, but it was an awful lot of time to invest in the jig itself when I could have just rough cut everything, screwed it all together, attached it to the CNC router, 
drawn the thing up in SketchUp and it, the router itself would have gone through and made this surface absolutely perfect. And to me, that makes a lot of sense because like I said, it probably took the better part of half a day to build this particular jig. And even if the, the CNC machine takes three or four hours to run, which it won't, uh, to get that surface perfectly level, I can be doing other things while it's going on. And it's going to make a better product than what I can make in my shop. Kind of like the, the miter triangles, definitely an upgrade from what I was making before. They're always a tiny bit off. This is absolutely perfect. Like I said, I'm not necessarily looking to replace the carving aspect of what I do. I'm also not going to turn around and start to have it cut out and create dovetail joints or pretty much any other kind of joint for me. Those things I feel for me personally are a, what this whole craft is about. But like I said, I can see it coming across and doing a lot of the monotonous, time consuming jobs or jobs that are inherently inaccurate places where you just stand a huge chance of getting really bad discrepancies and things like that. In fact, I have a project that I'm going to show you right now that is always a troublesome project and the CNC machine really takes a lot of that inaccuracy out of it and the problem is any little discrepancy that you create by doing something by hand is going to be really noticeable in the end product. So why don't we take a look at this? I'm going to walk you through the whole process from my SketchUp model straight through to the, the parts for this little project so that I can continue building with an already accurate foundation. So let's take a look. I have an upcoming project where I'm going to make a couple of these spice boxes. If I remove the door, you can see the interior has 11 different drawers. Now, you might be thinking I'm tempted to use the CNC router to cut out all my drawer parts, do some kind of joinery, but not so much. I'm actually going to use it for the one part of the project that is always tedious and is most prone to errors. I'm going to route the dados into the sides for all the drawer dividers. The first thing I did was bring in an additional case side and in SketchUp I made it unique. I rotate it around until it's at 90 degrees and then laying flat. Once I have it laying flat, I duplicate it and set, them, set it side by side. I need to have mirror images of one another for Fusion 360. Bring them together, rotate around, And now I'm going to explode both of those case sides. Obviously they were components. Once I have them exploded, I can now edit them as one big unit instead of two separate parts. So the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the dividing line between them. And then I'm going to raise the floor of what was the rabbit for the backboards. I'm going to bring it up to the level of the interior surface. This is why I made them unique. Had I been working in SketchUp now and not done that, I would be actually changing the case sides in my model. The next step is to remove all the dividing lines where the rabbits used to be. Once I have that done, I can extend the dados across into one another. Now I've created a full channel all the way across. Once I get everything tuned up, 
all the lines are erased and my dados are continuous from the left side all the way to the right, it's now time to save the file and export it as a DXF file. I get the OK from the AutoCAD export. I open it up in Fusion 360. I switch over to the Manufacture tab. Now I can start to get everything set up for actually running this thing on the CNC. I start with creating a new setup. Once I do that, I set the model origin to that back corner on the top surface. Then I add a 2D pocket and I select the bottom of each of the dados. You'll notice that when I select the second dado, it ends up highlighting the entire pair of case sides. That's because that little red arrow is on the outside of the dado itself, which means the machine is going to try and level everything down around it and leave nothing but the dado standing. Click on the little red arrow, it changes it from outside to inside, and we're good to go. The next thing I'm going to do is make sure that my tool orientation is right. I choose my Z-axis, which is one corner, and my X-axis, which I use a baseline on my dovetails. And then I pick my origin point, which is, again, that top left corner as you're viewing this thing. Under the Tool tab, I disable the, the coolant and I load a 1 8 inch flat end mill. Check all my feed rates, make sure everything looks like it's going to go nice and slow. I'm still a little hesitant to, to run this thing full tilt. There's a tab called Heights, and what that does is it tells, you, tells the machine exactly where to go. So I like my retract height up about an inch because I'm sure that I won't break a bit that way. Under the Passes tab, I change the rotation to Forward or Conventional Cutting instead of Climb Cutting. Check all my dimensions from all of my passes, and we're good. I don't use the stock to leave thing, but I do use the multiple depths tab. I want it to finish only on the final depth. I don't want it to finish somewhere else. And I like to have even step downs as it goes. Smoothing makes everything nice and even on those curves. The final tab is for linking. And when I Roll down through that. I pretty much take all the defaults in there. The only thing I change is the entry position. So I click the entry positions tab, and somewhere in that area where the rabbits were, I need to click the top edge of each of the, the dados so that the CNC router will come over, and that's the point where I want it to plunge in. Somewhere in that area where the, the rabbits are for the back, means if it runs around or misses a little bit or there's a little bit of overlap, it's buried in an area that's going to get cut away anyway. Once I have everything selected, I hit the simulate button and run it through. You can actually speed it up pretty fast to see how it goes. This is going to give you an idea of the path that the CNC router is actually going to take. And if you run it at regular speed, it'll give you a ballpark idea of how long it's going to take. Once I get the case side set up on the CNC machine, the program calculates that it's going to be about an hour and 15 minutes. To be honest, 
It, ro it ran the thing in about 45. Once it's done running through the simulation, there's only one step left, and that is to go back up and create the G code that is going to run the CNC router. So post process is what they call it in Fusion 360. Hit it, and you'll see that it's gonna ask you for a program number and all of that stuff. Hit OK, those are just defaults. And now you can see it has a 1001, and then I have to give this thing a name. So I'm calling it CNC Spice Box Sides. And it will export it to the folder of my choice as a CNC file. If everything works right, you should get a text edit box that pops up and shows you everything. Now that I've got the design all worked out, I grab a couple of the case sides, these are walnut, flatten them on the joiner. Sometimes it takes multiple passes. You can see that second side has a bit of a twist to it, so I try and keep all my pressure in one direction to stop it from rocking. It's the only way we're gonna get a flat surface. Once I get both boards flat, And you can see I didn't get rid of all the milling marks. I then run it through the planer until I get down to three quarters of an inch thick. Try and take multiple light passes for two reasons. Number one, I don't want to bog down the machine. Number two, I really don't want to do any damage to the wood by trying to take some massive kind of a cut. So I continually flip the boards and make sure that I'm milling equally off of both sides because even though this stuff has been in the shop for quite a while acclimating, there's still a fair amount of moisture trapped inside the material. If I mill it off all, all one side, I'm going to create a moisture imbalance, which is going to make things warp a really bad problem to have on the on the CNC machine. Once I get them down to three quarters, I joint one edge on each side and then I head over to the table saw. With my rip fence set at nine inches, I rip both case sides. And then set up the cross cut, I square one end, set a stop, and cut them both at 18 inches. The other thing you'll notice is after I make the squaring cut on the end of the board, I flip it end for end and I keep the same edge against the fence. With both case sides cut to size, I mark my triangle marking system on the front edge that tells me what is my top, my bottom, my inside and outside of each case side, as well as the front edge because I drew my triangle on there. Open it up like a book, lay it down flat, and now I need to get it oriented square to the bed of the CNC machine clamp it down, the more accurately I get it clamped perfectly square, the more accurately my dados are going to be 
routed into those case sides. Once I have the first side down, inside face up, by the way, I take the second side and I line it up so that it is flush on the top and the bottom with the inside face facing up. Those two case sides are back to back. Lock it down, make sure everything's adjusted. One last tighten on all the clamps and everything is ready to set up. I put my eighth inch bit into the collet and lock it into the router. Don't over tighten. I attach the mounting plate for the dust shroud. Put the dust shroud on there and adjust it so that about a quarter of an inch of the bit sticks down below the brush. Time to home the machine. So in the eating software, I click the home all button and bring the CNC machine to its base position. Then it's time to find the origin point, which if you remember, is that far left corner on the top of the surface. I need to bring that router bit down until it is perfectly centered on the corner of my two case sides. So I used the gross adjustments, which are really easy. The up and down arrow, left and right arrows are what make the machine move. The page up and page down brings the router up and down. If you add the shift key, it moves very rapidly. Once I get it really close, I go back into the eating software, kick back over and use the jog command and I can move this thing anywhere from one in one inch increments or all the way down to 10 thousandths of an inch at a time. I'm not quite that fussy, but I do try and get the router bit pretty much perfectly centered on the corner. Once I've got it done, it's now time to raise up the router, reattach the brush to the dust collection shroud. And now I can load up my program and hit the start button. Off we go. You'll see it cuts right across, drops it right down into the area where the rabbits are gonna end up and starts routing the very first dado. I have the thing set to route a little over a 32nd of an inch on each pass. It starts by very slowly ramping its way down into the case side on this first dado. I can probably go a little deeper for each pass, but honestly, I'm still getting my sea legs with this thing, so I'm taking it nice and slow. You can see when I get to that subtop up there, because the dado is three eighths of an inch wide, it runs a single pass down the middle and then starts to loop around and catch the sides. And that's where you can really see that I'm taking a pretty light pass. I found it pretty fascinating just to watch how the machine runs through all of the five dados in the two case sides. Normally I would be doing this with an edge clamp, a spacer, and my router with a 3 16th inch router bit in it. I'd have to lay out each of the case sides individually, make sure that I kept the spacer and the clamp on the same side of each of the dados, otherwise they would end up a little wonky left to right in the box when it's all done. This was so much easier. It got all programmed in, 
got everything set up, and off it went. One last check to make sure everything is square before I move the gantry and the router out of the way. Once I do that, I can release the two case sides and we're going to compare them one last time. Five dados in each and when I line them up top to bottom, the dados are absolutely perfect. So, like I said, absolutely amazing at how accurate the machine cut each one of these dados and the fact that I have two mirror image identical sides takes a lot of the guesswork out. Had I done this all by hand and I was off even a 32nd of an inch high on one side and low on the other that means that drawer divider is now tipped about a 16th of an inch over about a 12 or 13 inch space, which is gonna be really noticeable. So projects like this, and like I said, to build jigs, fixtures, stuff for the vacuum bag, I can even see, we used to make these little clamping blocks that would wrap around the sides of a corner cabinet. You have, you know, you have the two styles on the front on each side, a front style and then a return that goes back to the wall. Well, they're set at 45 degrees to one another and that whole assembly is 45 degrees to the wall. So how do you clamp up those two sections that go together? Well, we used to make these little blocks that would wrap around and we would just cut them out on the bandsaw. So I could see drawing this thing out in SketchUp, dropping some plywood on the, the, the CNC machine, and let it run for a couple hours just cutting out parts. And at the end of the day, I've got perfectly fitting blocks that help me get a much better product on my pieces of furniture. This is by no means an exhaustive list or even the, just the tip of the iceberg of the things that you could do with a CNC machine in your shop. You are really limited strictly by your imagination.